So it's time for the next panel. We're going to do the same thing. I'm not going to introduce anyone. So just questions if you have them, and then a microphone will be delivered. <coughs> Hi. So I was wondering, so a lot of Austrians disagree on where you should start studying the Austrian tradition. Uh, do you think that we should start with like man economy and state or should we start with human action or should we go far enough back and start with like Menger's principles of economics? My primer. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, yes. Yeah, like I'd say that then man economy and state it would be the order that I would suggest. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say whatever you find uh, engaging. Um, I, my first, I was introduced to Austrian economics through man, or, uh, human action, and uh, before I finished it, I went out and found Mises's collection of essays, uh, Planning for Freedom, and other essays, and those were more digestible. Most of those pieces, and then I eventually finished, and then it was only many years after that I came back to Man, Economy, and State, and so. I think I mean different people. Probably different it, different approaches are for is better for different people. But um, I, I would not say that that starting with Paris book would be a bad thing. I think it would be a good introduction. Um, but um, uh, you know, different people might find different works more attractive to to start with. I don't know. Yeah, don't start with Hayek. Uh, I, 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 Hayek is uh, good, and you should read him, but as a start, he's probably not the best author. I started with Hayek, and you see where, where it got me. <laughs> Dr. Bielan, especially in your presentation, um, I know you uh, basically, I don't know if you were defining a firm this way, but I said it was like a specialization, or I'm sorry, it's an island of specialization, whereas I thought, if I'm paraphrasing Coase, that it was really like an island of socialism, where in, in it's a refuge of, from prices because of transaction costs. And I was wondering if that, are those mutually exclusive or are those um, compatible? Okay, yeah, I can't believe Peter punted on that question, because he's done work on this too. Um, so I'm not known as a Coasean, and the reason for that is that Coase didn't understand economics. <laughs> And when I say that, I mean in his 1937 paper on the nature of the firm, he did not understand economics. He was not even an economics student. He was a student of commerce. And what he knew about economic theory, he learned from his fellow student, Abba Lerner. Yes, that Abba Lerner. <clears throat> and he, what he learned was that the market economy, the free market economy, would create an efficient outcome, but then, Hayek gave a number of, of lectures at LSE at the time, and he learned from Hayek that, wait a minute, there's heterogeneity in the resources in an economy. So Coase concluded that, wait a minute, there's, so there's heterogeneity that makes it really hard to discover things, and the economy is efficient. Well, maybe it's uh, difficult and costly to figure out what the right prices are for everything I need to buy. And therefore, since there's a cost to being efficient in the market economy, then a, a manager uh, directing resources instead can save on those transaction costs and therefore you have a firm. The problem with this, of course, is what are transaction costs if they're not part of the calculation of what is efficient? So obviously they have to be part of that. Well then, efficiency is really based off of the opportunity cost, including transaction costs. But he, he treats transaction costs as being external to what is the efficient solution. So hence my comment that he didn't understand economics. That's, that's a sort of a newbie mistake. Um, and as to your follow-up, sort of, are they compatible? And I don't think they are. Because the way I perceive the firm, it is a, a greater intensity of the division of labor implemented by the entrepreneur that the market does not yet support. It has nothing to do with transaction costs. Transaction costs will perhaps uh, increase profitability and extend the life of the firm, but it's not why it is created. It doesn't explain what the firm is at all. Uh, Coase even, this is maybe a little too deep for this, but Coase uh, really conceived of the firm and market production as being equal in terms of how you use resources. The only difference is that either you have the pricing mechanism 
to uh, direct resources, or you have the manager. So when transaction costs change, you just shift between the two, which of course doesn't make any sense at all. And if you see the firm as doing something different than the market is already doing, that argument simply doesn't apply. Right? And, and part of my theory um, is really based on, on a, an observation that you find in the great economist Karl Marx's uh, work, <laughs> Das Kapital, where he talks about the, that the division of labor within the firm is of a different kind and is much, much more intensive than it is in the marketplace. I've often heard this uh, term used, the U.S. exports inflation. I, it seems favorable, but I was wondering, what are the actual methods of transmission by which that happens, by which that occurs? Like how, what, in what accounting sense does the U.S. export inflation? Well, that was a, an idea that uh, was used in economic history um, specifically for the period of the Bretton Woods system when um, major currencies in Europe were tied to the US dollar. So uh, the Americans would inflate their uh, money supply and um, the Europeans were basically forced to follow uh, the Americans and print uh, new money and buy the dollars to keep their own currencies uh, um, at the fixed exchange rate to the US dollar. And the whole system, of course, broke when uh, Europeans started to ask for the gold that was uh, stored uh, in Fort Knox um, under uh, the leadership of Charles de Gaulle um, and back in the uh, late 60s. Um, and then Richard Nixon decided to end the Bretton Woods system. So that was a period when inflation, in a sense, was exported uh, from, the, uh, from the US to other countries because other countries had to follow the expansionary monetary policy course of the Americans. In regards to the socialist calculation debate, there's obviously a ton of responses that the socialists have thrown out there, and some of them are just so obviously bad. Do you think maybe it's because they're just misunderstanding, maybe they're not reading the source material, or are they just lying? Are they just bad faith? Um, yeah, so I can't look into their heads to see what, um, what's not clicking. Um, but I think if you just break it down, start with, like you said, with value theory, because I think a lot of them miss that part of it. Um, and it does seem, like Mises says, I mean, he really, I mean, if you follow the logic, he's really smashed the intellectual case for socialism. But it seems like I mean, they really want to have this end. We, we really want this. We'll keep trying uh, to figure out some way of solving the problem. Uh, but they won't. So I, I think there is some progress to be made, uh, is being made, um, like discussing with the, the cyber communists, at least the ones contributing to this special issue, that, I mean, they see the problem with, say, using the labor theory of value to try to create a a cardinal unit for measurement. Um, so there is a bit of talking past one another, and I think I mean, the, the continuing project is honing in precisely where that is and communicating that. So I, I, I hold out hope as possible. I guess one thing I'm, I speculate about is how much it starts with a moral sense. Right? Like if you start with the moral sense that socialism is good, then it logically follows it must be possible. That's the intuition of it. And I kind of wonder how much that is interfering with their ability to grasp the arguments that no, it's not possible. If it's not possible, then it can't be good. And questioning people's moral foundations is very, very difficult to get people to shift on. So. I would like the panel's opinion on Ludwig von Mises' claim in human action uh, that birth control is indispensable for the preservation of peaceful hu human cooperation and the social division of labor. Well, uh, I thought about this. I had a couple of minutes, so... Um, <laughs> um, I think that uh, sounds maybe a bit controversial as a statement, but uh, it uh, is probably not that controversial, at least in the historical uh, context. Um, there are some historians, economic historians, sociologists, uh, 
we've done some work on the uh, impact of demographics on uh, military conflicts. So in Germany, for example, there's uh, Gunnar Heinzorn. He uh, was a professor in Bremen. He passed away a couple of years ago. And he uh, presented an argument that uh, basically um, strong population growth, uh, in particular the number of young men in families, is a contributing factor to military conflicts. So it's obvi obviously not necessarily, uh, necessarily the case that military conflict uh, arises out of uh, strong population growth, but um, it makes conflicts more likely so to speak. And I think that was not a controversial um, view back in the days when Mises wrote that. And I think something like that he probably had in mind. As far as the social division of labor uh, is concerned, I have, don't have a good answer on that, really. I, I don't see how uh, strong population growth uh, causes a problem there. Hello. Um, so I... I <laughs> I had a question about uh, public goods, and this was um, a question that I brought up to Dr. Engelhart earlier yesterday. Um, but is the Austrian view of public goods that they don't exist insofar that in entrepreneurs can find ways to make them rivalrous or exclusive, or it like how how exactly what what is the Austrian view of public goods in that way? On this question, I'd recommend reading, I believe it's in the appendix of Man, Economy, and State, it might be in Power and Market, in which Rothbard comments on public goods and also the idea of positive and negative externalities. And I think an issue with like, your typical public goods analysis um, from a mainstream perspective is that, like, okay, so I, I think of uh, an example that was presented where uh, they say, so you got these stargazers in a city. And uh, they want other people in the city to turn their lights off. And we assume collectively they'd be willing to pay enough to uh, get everybody else to voluntarily turn their lights off, pay us off. But there's a free rider problem. And so uh, the authors say, you know, you tax these people their willingness to pay, and uh, they make the deal happen. Look, the state improves welfare. But the problem with that is that there's conceptually, I mean, we can distinguish between uh, transaction costs, uh, this transaction being made, being too high, and oh, the state just comes in and solves it, uh, versus, I mean, like I said, transaction costs I mean, are already baked into it. So it, people can't, there's not, we can't make this distinction between uh, people actually not wanting to do it, uh, not being willing to pay uh, a sufficient amount to get people to turn their lights off, versus uh, they would like to, but the um, transaction costs are too high. So the thing is, if you can't, uh, through demonstrated preference, observe the fact that this public good should be provided, but it's not. That's no different than um, saying people demonstrate they don't want this thing. So as an outside observer, we can't say this good is being underprovided. Does that make sense? Eh? <laughs> no, it wasn't very articulate. No, that was very good, Tate. Um, I just want to add that a lot of the criticism of Rothbard's uh, utility and welfare economics uh, is based on examples that are made up where they make all the necessary assumptions to know whether a certain government intervention improves uh, the situation or not. The problem is, in practice, we don't have this information. And Rothbard hammers this home in the article, right? It's on the basis of demonstrated preferences that we can know what people want, uh, if at all. A couple other responses that we could add to this. One, I think it was actually Coase, for better or worse, uh, observed that one of the common examples that is given of a public good would be a lighthouse. And he just made the observation that well, nobody has actually checked to see if it's impossible to provide a lighthouse. Uh, and after he made this observation, like other mainstream economists looked and found, no, actually we, we see organizations spontaneously form because they don't want to have their ships crash into the coast. Right? So, so they managed to 
do some cost sharing and provide these lighthouses without the need for it to be funded by taxes. And there are other cases where like, we can very obviously see non-rivalry, non-excludability. I, I think I mentioned in my uh, lecture about radio waves. And yet radio stations exist. Well, it turns out people do value the ability to listen to music over the radio, so radio stations figured out they could pair that good, which is non-excludable and also non-rival, with airtime, which is excludable and rival, and they can sell off some airtime to advertisers to provide this good. Right? So we do see that entrepreneurs do actually solve these problems. Right? So, so not just theoretically do we have problems with identifying if there's even a public good here, but practically, we see things we think might be public goods actually provided. Right, so. Hello. Um, what has been, the, if there is one, the historical approach from the Austrian perspective into investing into public and private markets? And how should we go about approaching these investments today from an Austrian perspective? I don't know what public markets are. Is there even such a thing? The stock market, like public equities. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that the only, th I mean, you, you invest in them entrepreneurially, right? So you just try to assess, um, you know, what, what, what's going to happen to the value of the assets of the firm, which would be reflected in the value of the asset of the, the share, and make your decisions that way. I mean, buy low, sell high would be my, <laughs> my Austrian recommendation. <laughs> so in Dr. Patrick Newman's lecture on banking, he talked about how in a free banking system, the adverse clearing mechanism prevents banks from overinflating. But I know some Austrians prefer a policy of 100% reserve banking. So why isn't a free banking system sufficient to control inflation? Well, it probably would be sufficient. I mean, uh, it's not entirely clear what a free banking system would mean or how it would look like in practice, right? It depends on certain institutional arrangements, uh, rules uh, and regulations that do not necessarily come from the states, but just um, rules of the game that are implemented uh, in some way. Uh, and. I believe a free banking system, generally speaking, uh, if it, it is not uh, distorted by too much government uh, regulation, will lead certainly to lower inflation than we have right now. Uh, whether it prevents inflation entirely, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's also not not desirable. Right? Who knows what the optimal rate of, of inflation or deflation is. In terms of um, arguments against central planning, I wonder if you guys might be able to shed some light on the difference between Hayek's knowledge problem and Mises' calculation problem and whether or not they are the same thing or a restatement of the same argument. Is Joe Salerno still here? <laughs> <laughs> I see those um, arguments as uh, complementary in, in, in some ways. I believe Mises made uh, the more fundamental uh, argument, but I think Hayek uh, cleared uh, or, or added to that in, in, in certain ways by emphasizing uh, some types of knowledge that uh, are not um, uh, communicated uh, through the pricing mechanism, a tacit knowledge that uh, is sort of decentralized and uh, di uh, distributed in the, in the society and uh, can come into, uh, uh, yeah, can have an, an, a good effect on the economic outcome only to the extent that we have a market order, not a central planning. Is it conceivable that uh, the hoarding of money during a recession could ever be problematic? Uh, it seems that the Austrians are the only one who deny this and even Hayek talked about a secondary depression and, well, I know he had many different views over his career, but at some point at least talked about keeping the flow of spending MV constant, but this isn't universally accepted amongst Austrians. I think, I think Mises even commented on that too um, in uh, one of the essays in 
on one of the essays that was that he published in the like 29 to 32 that's in the what the collection on on the manipulation of money and credit or something but it seems to me that people holding money is just acting according to preference and so i, I mean if the, the, the re a recession occurs when you have a large cluster of entrepreneurial error and if people, if the entrepreneurs do, do not foresee that demand for their products are falling because, or will or will fall because people are going to want to hold their cash instead of spend it, well, then they're going to earn losses. And those entrepreneurs that do perceive that that is happening and act accordingly, they will uh, they'll reap profits. They'll come out okay. And so, um, it, the the preference for money isn't isn't um, it isn't in any special economic category uh, relative to a preference to want to buy rutabagas or something. Uh, so I mean, it, it's just it's it's if if then that is the case, which I think is the case, if we act to try to somehow uh, you know if we act to say increase the money supply sort of to to to, to respond to that, we actually work against the desire of the people to want to hold more purchasing power because we're watering down the value of the thing that they want to hold. So we're, we're actually working against the, the preferences of the people that are wanting to hold, hold more money. And, and as, lo as, long as, as long as we have a free, free price system, prices do adjust, they will adjust, and um, the markets will clear, and we won't, have, we won't, we won't be wallowing in, in, in depression. <clears throat> this is for Dr. Byland. Uh, what is your opinion on the Swedish National Bank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel and its historic winners? <clears throat> Do you want me to comment on all of them? <clears throat> I mean, it's, to begin with, it's not a real Nobel Prize, right? Uh, it was not in Alfred Nobel's will. Uh, it was instituted by the central bank. Um, I think Hayek put it really well in, in, in his Nobel lecture that this type of prize is dangerous. That doesn't mean I would turn it down. But, <laughs> but it, giving uh, economists this kind of prestige is dangerous, especially when economists are working on evaluating policy and recommending policy. Uh, to then give them this prestige, I mean, that means that they can, that there are fewer limits to what nasty business they can actually implement through policy. So I, in that sense, I'm, I'm opposed it, to it, but I'm also glad that it brings attention to economic issues, uh, which is a good thing. But there are other ways of doing it than having a, a major prize and, and, and a king handing it out. And if I could comment on that too, another, another way this, this danger sort of works itself out is most often, more often than not, the winners, when they start commenting on public policy, are commenting on policy areas that have nothing to do with the research for which they actually supposedly won the prize. And so, that, I mean, it really does ante up the prestige level and, and make people think that they know way more than they do about almost anything. Um, so, seeing as one of the key starting assumptions of Austrianism is preferences being rendered intelligible through a price system, how would we contend with some of the um, limitations of an Austrian standard of analysis when there are certain assumedly valid subjective preferences that are not easily reducible to money terms? I have to admit I did not understand the question. Could you, yeah. Yeah, could you so? It seems to me, okay, so even if, sure, everybody has preferences that are not easily reduced to, to money, you know, to money terms. I mean, how, you, only a fool would try to, try to sort of place a monetary value on the love that he has for his wife or something. I mean, that, that marriage is not going to last very long <laughs> if you try to do that. I mean, it's just as a, just a, just a little life hack from old Doc Rittenauer. Uh, um, so, but, but, but those preferences, those preferences will, will um, still, those preferences affect our action, will then, that which then will have some impact on uh, whatever we do, and to the extent that it has an impact on what we 
buy and sell will be reflected in the price system. So there is no – again, as long as, we, as long as we have a free society, those preferences will work themselves out the way pr- – other preferences work themselves out. There's no necessary. There's no necessary conflict. There's no necessary contradiction. There's ne- no necessary things we have to sort out. It seems to me that, uh, uh, as far as I understand your question. All right, we're out of time. Thank you so much. <laughs>